The topic today is the question of the organization of Reagan's cabinet. And the second part of it is a secret Iranian-Iraqi war that broke out in September of 1980, just as Reagan was elected, and lasted until 1988. And today is the 7th of July, 2015, and my guest is David DeWitt, co-editor of the Athens News and reporter for the Athens News. And he, uh, or I am, a retired historian from Ohio University, Robert Whaley. And this is Athens Speak Out in 337. And summarizing what happened last time. Our show explained how Ronald Reagan won a sweeping victory at the elections of November 1980. And Reagan took 44 states, and Jimmy Carter, the incumbent, only got six states. Meanwhile, the Democrats lost 12 Senate seats on Reagan's coattails. Six of them were Democratic conservatives who usually voted with the Republicans on most issues. But six were uh, former peacemakers, Vietnam War era doves, who began as early as 1964 in denouncing all presidents who were involved in the Vietnam War. And they tried to uh, cut down the power of Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon nibbling away at the budget, but were ultimately unsuccessful. Although uh, Ray, uh, Nixon's last administration, uh, he was finally forced to resign in 1974 because a lot of evidence was building up against his flawed administration. The Doves, the senatorial Doves, were allied with Harvard, Berkeley, University of Michigan, and about a thousand other universities, including Ohio University, and we had local teach-ins. And uh, the anti-war movement among the students was allied to Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement, so that uh, Washington was being questioned but only by academics, and a majority of the voters with only 18 years of high school education were still left in the dark. Why was the Vietnam War necessary, and why was Lyndon Johnson's anti-communism and Richard Nixon's anti-communism, which led right up to Ronald Reagan, still effective at <coughs> propaganda from the uninformed, so that uh, Reagan was elected on the aftermath of the anti-communist communist crusades of former presidents. Now, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and four or five other major urban papers uh, supported uh, the students in the end of the war, but uh, Johnson and Nixon and Reagan uh, could ignore them by going directly to television, and television catered to the average 18-year-old uh, voter. And uh, the campaign to bring the boys home uh, failed, and that led to uh, a new so-called Cold War. Reagan was able to bring back uh, militarism in a slight and a, a less vocal form. Anyway, since 1974, fewer and fewer uh, reporters were able to get at to the truth. And that's the job of the historian, is to shed light on the complexities of the American military industrial complex through a detailed analysis of history. 
and uh, Reagan then uh, won his victory and would continue that uh, senatorial uh, victory for the Republican Party. Uh, we left off uh, one of the rather individual winners on the Democratic side. Uh, his name uh, was Eagleton, and Eagleton in 1980 was re-elected. And the importance of Eagleton is that he came close to becoming the vice president, but the uh, Republicans were able to expose Eagleton as having uh, mental illnesses and uh, being a, a incurable drunk and was not qualified to be the vice president. And uh, McGovern had to force him to resign. And that went against McGovern's possibility of getting elections. In any case, uh, Eagleton carried on personally and came back to the Senate and he was re-elected, and he proved that he was sober enough at least to stay another six years, and he didn't make it in 1988. He had to retire then, uh, or 80, uh, and, and 84, or no, 88, his, he had a six-year term, and he died of a, a natural death. No, no one really knows whether he could have made it if he had become vice president. Would he have had the ability, because there's a lot of pressure on the president, to make command decisions. Right. And the average right. House of Representatives can get by with a little bit of alcoholism and uh, <laughs> mental problems. Uh, Surely many have. Many have, yes. Um, I still think have. Eagleton was a better vice presidential pick than Sarah Palin. Well, that could be <laughs> proven. Sarah Palin was a, was a clown, wasn't she? <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, she was not in the race. And uh, McGovern himself apologized to Eagleton after he was reelected and said, well, I'm sorry I had to dump you, but I was pressured to do so. And uh, McGovern himself had the same problem. McGovern had five kids. And his middle daughter was a college student, only a freshman in 1972 when he was campaigning. So she got, was in college and she got caught up with alcoholism and drugs and she was able to survive the campaign, but 10 or 15 years later, she died in a, uh, an alcoholic accident by being drunk uh, in the wintertime. And yeah. That was a tragic thing and uh, McGovern had to write a memoir on the loss of his daughters and that's one of the losses that children of big shot celebrities, whether they're in Hollywood or in, in politics, have to suffer. And there have been a lot of... Oh, just the uh, eye of public scrutiny? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sure there's a there's lot so of pressure. so much publicity, that, yeah. because they expect that the children will live up to the expectations of the father. Right. And, and well, we've been seeing, you know... Lots of, lots of... We've seen things. failures from that from the very beginning. John Adams' son. Yes, uh, John Adams. Who died of alcoholism at the age of 30, That's I believe. True. Uh, oh, Charles. Yeah, yeah. Charles Adams. No, his name was John Adams. Was John it? Quincy Adams. Well, was that the was the president. That's the one that became president. Yeah. And then he had another son who died at age 30 of alcoholism. Maybe it was, yeah, maybe it was Charles. I, I forgot that. Uh, yeah, he died of alcoholism at Harvard University. <laughs> and John Adams had to disown him. Right, yeah, he did. There's a famous because they were, in which he takes a cane and he goes down to Harvard and he wipes the glasses off and said, you wasted all my money. Uh, You'll never make it. Yeah. Now, his mother was somewhat sympathetic. Abigail was, yeah, she, has, she, she was had, kinder. She had to take care of the child. Yeah. But he, he never did amount to too much. Anyway, that's the tragedy of politics and religion and life. Psychological persons here might have some comments on that. Do you want to interrupt? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's ask our first question then uh, to our guest. Uh, did Ronald Reagan's coattails have any effect on the Democratic House of Representatives in November of 1980? 
Oh, yes. It switched hands. No, not the, the House of Representatives. No, not the House. The yeah. Senate switched hands. Yeah, but it did have an impact. Yeah. There okay. was Republicans gained a net of 35 seats yes, in the House. Yes, that's true. But that wasn't sufficient. It wasn't enough to switch yeah, uh, party Tip control. Tip O'Neill became Tip the, main, O'Neill was the, the major Democratic. opposition all during the Reagan administration. If you want to call what he did opposition, I think he was a little bit, uh, he worked hand in hand with Reagan on a lot of stuff. On what, for example? Well, the expansion of the military. Well, yeah, the the military is that's been a bipartisan effort that's for been a bipartisan seventy effort. years now, though. Yeah, that's been bipartisan since Truman. Yeah. No Democrat or Republican, except a few venturesome people, like the seventeen, eighteen Dubs, in nineteen sixty-five to nineteen seventy-two. McGovern and his McGovern colleagues. McGovern and the rest, right. They put resolutions. Let's have the uh, administration cut back the military by a couple of million dollars and let's bring the boys home. But those were always outvoted right. by, by the Hawks and the Democratic Party. No, no one is going to vote against the Veterans of Foreign War or the American Legion because they're a tremendous lobby for re-election. Everybody thinks the military wins wars, but a historian knows the military is one arm of a four-armed elite. The military, yes. Politics, yes. Economics, yes. And ideological uh, uh, ideolo ideology, ideas, and philosophy are important. And people don't know how to and put them together, unless they get a law degree or a PhD. And the, the average person is caught in specialization. He gets locked into the military bo box, mm -hmm. and he can't think outside of the box. That's the tragedy yeah. of... Well, I think that's... Of these senators now in, in, uh, in Congress. What do they want to do about the Middle East? They don't know. Yeah, they no, don't know. I haven't heard have one. no idea. What, we what we could go off on a whole other uh, you wanna, you, show on yeah, that. Yeah, you want to fight for another year, or do you want to go for 30 years? Right. Put up because your money. <laughs> well, and anyway. what's the end game, really? What are you trying to accomplish? If well, we're talking about the Iraq, that's, there Nixon's, needs to be clear Nixon's goals. Nixon's end game was to prove that the Democrats sold out China. But that was past history. It was a it was a proving a myth. Oh yeah, <laughs> and yeah. Ronald Reagan and he and he was able to position himself right, through the help of Henry Kissinger as the communism is the only enemy and the major enemy. Right, and, that and was, he didn't he wasn't didn't don't bother me with the details about <laughs> Israel and Lebanon and sure yeah, yeah. No, he, he didn't care about that. Well, that's how he got through his administration. Anyway, to get to the key. Do you want to say anything more about uh, Tip O'Neill and his loss of 34 seats? Well, um, I, like no, no I, I don't think, well, it didn't hurt his majority, so he's still controlled. It didn't hurt his majority, but the concessions, even though he did vote for the military, he got certain concessions on minimum wage, uh, Social Security, True. The, tip, the typical bread and butter issues, and... Reagan's tax cuts could not bite as deep if if Tip O'Neill hadn't been there. Sure, if oh Tip yeah. If Tip O'Neill hadn't been there, it'd be clean sweep. Yeah. Yeah, that's well, that's absolutely yeah, but, true. So, and, yeah, but so and Tip had, had, had to give up some the stuff. Dam. He could hold the yeah the the bread and butter issues for the working class and the unions, and can't roll us back all together. And Reagan didn't have to face the tax bill. Well, yeah. And he did have to face a strike in the airlines union. Right, the airline strike. And he had unemployment. You know, he, his polls went down in 82. And that's about... Yeah, when Ronald Reagan first came in, his course. first two years were a failure economically. Mm -hmm. Because they were rolling back the automobile industry and the... Well, they, yeah, <laughs> they and, have and all Reagan this... Reagan kept that publicity on there. Yeah. I mean, uh, O'Neill. O'Neill kept... kept, kept uh, Reagan's speak to the fire on bread and butter issues. Well, anyway, in the 1982 election, Ronald Reagan 
picked up a few more seats in the House of Representatives, or the Republican Party did, but it wasn't enough. Now, in 84, they won m many more because Mondale got, got badly beaten in the 1984 election. And, but it was still not enough. Not Never, to get the House. Yeah, yeah the no. House kept on even on the, but their majority was being cut back all the time. Right. They didn't have the overwhelming. Which had to be concerning for Tip O'Neill, at least, as, or at least as some sort of motivation to work a little bit, maybe a little bit more with uh, the Republicans than he otherwise would have, uh, well, out of fear that yeah, yeah, they'd continue the to bleed got, seats. As the majority got closer, he had to make more concessions Right. on the budget. Okay, let's go to another question. Number two. Did Ronald Reagan, the great actor, get any newspaper endorsements? Well, this is, I, I saw this question and I tried to do some research on it and I actually found it difficult to find out who was endorsing. I'm sure he got some major endorsements, yeah. but I was unable to find a list of newspaper endorsements in the okay. country well, I'm glad that laid them out. At least looked at the problem. Yeah. Because I did look at the problem a little deeper, I say, I suppose. The answer is, it's ambiguous of how the provincial press in the cities of Ohio handled Ronald Reagan. Now, if you really want to do the research, you'd have to look at the Athens News, the Columbus Dispatch. And that's what this, I couldn't find. Yeah. I'm pretty sure the New York Times endorsed oh, Well, Carter, the New York Times is open. The Washington but, Post is open. Yeah. But, but you'd have to go down paper by but paper. But like the Columbus Dispatch, the you'd Cleveland have, Plain Dealer, you yeah, know, the Chicago Sun Times, I don't know. Well, you have to do a lot of work. Yeah. You'd have to be a specialist on those newspapers yeah. to do it. And no no living journalist wants to do that <laughs> unless you work. Well, we have to leave that to the that, historians. Well, no. You've heard of the Columbia, uh, the, uh, the Columbia Journalism Review. Have, oh, yeah, CJR. Yeah, yeah, if you taught journalism at Berkeley, you could do an MA thesis on how did the Ohio papers in 88 counties handle the Reagan election. And you could find it. I'm sure that would be but fascinating. But you'd have to have a statistician and look at every issue and see how the editorials were played. It's just a lot of hard work. Yeah. And well, you'd have to go through every one. Yeah. What, it, what was it? Was it that. unemployment yeah. or inflation? Yeah, right, or? right. It's, it's, a hard, it's a hard research. So anyway, uh, the, the basic answer is ambiguous, but the Democrats held the New York Times, the Washington right. Post, and then academic magazines, which I read, the Nation magazine, they endorse the Democrats straight across the board. That, well, that sounds about yeah. right and for the then Nation. The academic magazines are the New York Review of Books, the London Review of Books and the TLS, they don't endorse anybody, but they review the new memoirs coming out. And mm -hmm. they will look at the Nixon memoirs and look for holes in the Democratic propaganda based on the new sources, okay? So the New York Review of Books and the London Review of Books and the TLS keep up with characters like Henry Kissinger. What is Henry Kissinger saying now? So you can get biographies and... Oh, yeah. Read between the lines. That's, that's what historians are supposed to be doing, looking at the footnotes. It's hard work. Yeah. I looked at the Nazi press in 1937, 38, when I had to do this thing on the Spanish Civil War. Oh, yeah, your book. Yeah. There was a famous bombing called the Bombing of Guernica. And the Luftwaffe did it. And they killed a lot of Basques unnecessarily. But then Franco took the city, and he was able to censor the news and say, well, there was no bombing, and the entire... They tried to deny the bombing entirely. They said it never, it never occurred, and it uh, became a problem in journalism. It never occurred, and it was the retreating anarchists that burned the city down. Wow. The, the wow. retreating Basques went to Bilbao, the capital of the Bilbao country, and there was an enterprising journalist from the... London Times, and he in, he got oral, oral testimony from 80 some odd witnesses, and then he published an article in the London Times 
about the bombing. And then the New York Times picked up the London Times story. And this is how uh, the communist press picked up the story. And then this is how Picasso in Paris knew there was bombing, and he painted that painting within a, within a month after it had occurred. Wow. Well, Picasso was censored, the movies were censored, that was all Everything. censored news until Franco died. And then that would have been, what, 75? Yeah. So anyway, that was in 1975, but, and of course, then, see, this painting, which Picasso did, was sent to the museum in New York, Metropolitan, the, not the Metropolitan, but the uh, modern art. Yeah, and he said, when Spain art. returns to a democracy, it'll go back to Spain. Uh -huh. Well, in the 1980s, after Franco died, the, the original Guernic is now in the Prado in Madrid. Oh, wow. It was just wow. on loan in New York. That's quite a story. You didn't know that? I had never heard that before, no. Did you, but you have heard of the painting, Guernic. I have, oh, and yeah. And you had heard of the bombing of the Guernic. Yeah. Well, a journalist by the name of Steer exposed that within a month. But the London Times was a conservative appeasing paper, they fired this guy. Oh. So then Steer wrote a book about it, The Tree, the tree of Guernica. So then the book was published, and then this became a crusade underground by all of the left-wing supporters mm -hmm. of the failed republic. So the truth can be discovered with hard work. Yeah. But well, I guess it shows the importance yeah. of the freedom of the press. And the freedom of the press wins in the long run. In the but long in the short run. run, Ronald Reagan won it. <laughs> 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 okay, so I did do a little investigation. There is a magazine called The Editor and the Publisher. Uh-huh, I'm familiar. Yeah, now they list by year, 1972, 1980, 1984, 1988, 1992, every four years. As far as the newspaper endorsements. Yeah, but it's just a general blanket endorsement by party. Uh -huh. In other words, in 1972, there were, six, there were 56 newspapers that supported the Democratic candidate, and there were 753 papers that supported the Republican candidate. But they didn't name the things by name unless you go to the editor and publisher and look all of that up and then trace it back to each newspaper like the Cincinnati Inquiry. That was yeah. probably one of them. Yeah. Okay. So from, 70, from 72 to 80, the Democrats actually picked up endorsements. In 1980, there were 129 papers that took the risk to endorse the Democratic candidate. And the Republican candidate, the Republican Party press, went down to four, uh, 414. So there were more Democratic endorsements of Reagan's opposition in the 1980 election, but not enough to tilt, tilt it at all. Yeah. Yeah, because who cares how they... The way, who cares what newspapers yeah, say? Yeah, what the, what the, what the <laughs> Arizona paper endorsed. Yeah. Okay. Unless you come from that state. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Everything is local. Yeah, well, it doesn't yeah. matter to anybody well, in Butte, since, since Montana. Since 1980, in 84, 88... 70, uh, 92, the Democrats have gone up and down. There's no trend, except the trend is... How closely does it follow the winner? Well, it, you have to look at it year by year, but let's yeah. just look at the Democratic. In 1984, the newspapers, 80, uh, 68 newspapers endorsed the Democrat. In 1988, when Dukakis was running, it went up to 103. And then in 92, when Clinton was running, it went up to 193. Then after Clinton got into trouble in 96, it went down to 80. That shows you the second term. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, in uh, 2000, it, the Democrats went up to 116. And then in 2004, after Bush's war was failing, yeah. it went up to 213. Uh -huh. So the Democratic papers, I mean, the newspapers do follow the elections. Yeah. But only in broad, general terms, okay? Unless you want to do a lot of research. Yeah. Not in specifics. Okay. Now, and the last date I have is 200, 2008. 100 
uh, 87 uh, newspapers support the Democratic campaign. And the Republicans are up and down, depending on yeah. it. Because it goes down 380, 387. In 1984, that was the maximum Republican endorsements. Then it goes down to 241, 138, 122. Then they shoot up again in 2000. That was the Florida forged election. Yeah. Bring, uh, the, the one where Al Gore won the yeah, popular yeah, vote. Yeah, right. So that's, you can find broad statistics. That's in a magazine called Editor and Publisher if you want to do a lot of work. A lot of work. Now, in 1996, 70% of all the newspapers endorsed neither candidate. That's the real trend. And USA never endorses any candidate by, mm. by law. And that's what the messenger, the messenger never endorses. They just don't endorse either one. The news always endorses. And the news yeah. always endorses the Democrats. They're consistent. We have endorsed some Republicans. Yeah, on local races. Local races, yeah. yeah. You're not going to support Kelly any longer. <laughs> yeah. Well, we didn't. We, we supported uh, uh, Steve yeah. Kane that year. Yeah, you were. He actually, was a Republican. You were ahead of the kick of Kurt. Well, oh, the yeah. Was the he, he had already stopped talking to us at that point. Yeah, for whatever reason. You might probably know Apparently more about Apparently, he thought it would help him if he stopped talking to the well, news. Well, you might know more about that than I do. Yeah. I was not on the inside of that paper. But anyway, uh, Wall Street Journal never endorses. But their news articles are so biased in favor well, of Well, yeah, I think it's pretty obvious what the <laughs> Wall Street Journal it's, believes. It's almost 100% Republicans. And that was even before yeah, Murdoch was, bottom. Back, you know, the last time they endorsed, they never endorsed. No, that, that goes back to the 20s when they began recording this. Now, the Washington uh, Post always endorsed the liberal candidate, except in 1988. I was going to say, well, in, Ben Bradley was publisher, maybe. Well, in 1988, the Washington Post endorsed neither candidate, neither Dukakis nor Bush 41. <laughs> they were a little bit suspicious of Dukakis. Now, the New York Times stuck by Dukakis. Mm -hmm. But the... Uh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, well, nobody does it. Nobody else does. But I followed the Dukakis very carefully. I was kind of interested in that. Were you a Dukakis yes. supporter? Oh, yeah. In the primary? In every election. Okay. You know I know Dukakis personally. No, I didn't know that. All right, well, let's go back to square one. I thought everybody knew that. <laughs> no, I didn't know that. I went to Bates College as a student. Uh-huh. I went to Bates in the class of 48. I was 18, okay? And I'm in the class of 52. Okay, got the dates clear? My roommate in my sophomore year, purely by accident, was Stelian Dukakis, the older brother of Michael. <laughs> okay. How about that? Now, I had moved from Long Island to Southern Delaware, Del Mar, Delaware. Mm -hmm. And Stelian Dukakis was a great Christian. And he says to me, he said, Paul, I would like to invite you to my hometown in Brookline, Massachusetts. It was actually a witch suburb called Chestnut Hill. And you can meet my mother and my father and my younger brother, and we'll have Thanksgiving dinner. Now, the reason why Steely and Dukakis went to Bates College is that both the father and mother, Euterpe Dukakis and Panos Dukakis, were immigrants from Turkey in 1910. They, they were Greek ethnics in Turkey, mm -hmm. and the Turks were still fighting wars against the Greeks. So they came to Boston in, in uh, 1910 and worked in munitions factories in World War I. Did they move to Massachusetts? Yeah, they went directly to Massachusetts, and okay. Boston is a kind of a Greek center. Lots of Greeks settled in Boston. Uh, we got to stop. Station break. Station break. Uh, we, we're kind of off the subject. Yeah. I'm talking to uh, Steve DeWitt about Reagan's campaign, and we were talking about endorsements. 
And I thought that he knew, and that everybody knew, that I knew Michael Dukakis personally. And I, I don't know how I didn't know that. That's okay. You don't have to, <laughs> you don't have to follow me. I'm not a personality. But, but I think that Jeff Reisner knew it. Okay. And yeah. certainly Steve Antle knew it. Yeah. And other people who know me in the faculty knew it. Yeah, the whole history department knew that. Yeah. Okay. So you had Thanksgiving with the family Dukakis. I had Thanksgiving in 49 with, with the whole Dukakis family. And as I was getting to the mother and father, the mother went to Bates College in 1925. And she was the pioneer in bringing panels over. Because the woman, the women, assimilate faster than the male. The male is kind of poor in language. But she went to Bates, majored in theater, majored in history, and got a degree in Bates in the class of 1925. And the reason why she went to Bates is that she went to high school in Haverhill, Massachusetts, and this teacher, who was a graduate of Bates College, said, well, you're a pretty brilliant kid. I think I can get you a scholarship to go to Bates if you apply to Bates. So she went to Bates from Haverhill, Massachusetts, by a scholarship. Yeah. And then Dukakis, Panos was coming over, and Panos only had one year at Bates. And then he transferred immediately to Harvard Medical School. And he had the Greek population of Boston. He was the first the Greek doctor, doctor for the yeah. Greek uh, settlements. And yeah. he could speak the language. So he had a he had a hand in he had a he worked his tail off twelve hours a day, serving the whole Greek community. Meanwhile, he got a paid job for Lieber Brothers. He used to manufacture life boy soap, and he was their paid physician for the for the factory. For the company. Yeah. So he had a salary plus a business, and then Euterpe was the great politician. She subscribed to Atlantic Magazine and Harper's. And she trained her sons all in New Deal philosophy, okay? New Deal populist Politics. Democrats. Yeah. yeah, that's right. It's very intelligent. Language acquisition is harder to pick up after a certain age. <coughs> you got it. You got it. They must be very intelligent. Well, anyway, to get back to Michael, I knew immediately, see, Michael was a, a, a junior in high school then. He was three years younger. Mm -hmm. Three years younger than I am, three years younger than Steelian. I knew immediately he was more brilliant than Steelian. Uh, Chestnut Hill was an elite community. Practically 90% of the public school were Jewish kids. Mm -hmm. And then there was one Greek family there, the Dukakis family. And all of the Irish kid, kids used to blame the Dukakises. Oh, you're a you're a, you're a Jew. So they had ethnic conflict from day one. You see. What year was this? What's that? What year was this? Nineteen forty. Let's go back to the screen. I was born in nineteen thirty. Stealing was born in nineteen thirty. Right. So when he was growing up, in plush circumstances, because. Panos Dukakis was able to build this mansion right. with cheap prices in 1939 mm. in the Depression because he had enough money to buy a palatial estate in Chestnut Hill in this rich suburb. Now, what was your question now? No, I was just wondering what year it was. 1939 they built. I went down there 10 years later when I was 19 and Steelian was in college and Michael was in high school. But Michael's high school was so advanced, he was using as a textbook Charles Beard and Mary Beard <laughs> as a high school textbook. Wow! <laughs> I never heard of these authors until I got to college. Yeah. Hey, I didn't know the author of my textbook. Right. Well, well, I guess that shows what the education gap that, will that's do. Impressive. That's impressive. Well, anyway, Steelian 
I mean, Michael doesn't go to Bates because Bates was a kind of a middle, right. middle class college on the same level as Ohio Wesleyan. I mean, well, it, it, would you consider that? It's educational. Like it's educational. But it was like Ohio Wesleyan or Worcester. But Stillian, I mean, Michael goes to Swarthmore College, number one or number two of the small colleges. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And he had his classmates, the son of uh, Black on the Supreme Court, and another Hugo one. Hugo Black? Yeah. yeah. And another son was Douglas, the two most liberal guys on the okay, Supreme Court. Yeah. And his roommate was a half Quaker, half Jewish guy by the name of Michael Sievitz, who became went to a Rhodes Scholarship, went right to time. Well, so the Swarthmore kids... Yeah, they did they, well. They do very well. Well, and they well compete with that's Oberlin. great. Oberlin, Oberlin is with the... With Oberlin, yeah. Oberlin is the... What does that mean? I'm sorry. What's the question now? The Swarthmore kids? Say that a question a little slower now. The name of the school. Oh, Swarthmore College. So, oh, okay. Swarthmore College is in Pennsylvania. Oh, is it is a nice school? It's a it's a it's a college. It's a college. A small college. That's something I would I mean I, I haven't heard of it. I was wondering <clears throat> how how long, was it like Christian or was it? Well, it was founded by the Quakers, by the and it's still a Quaker school. Oh, it's a Quaker school. Yeah. And uh, Quakers persist of what again? I'm not sure. What's the question now? The Quakers. What is a Quaker? Yes. All right, a Quaker is a, one of the Protestant religions. Are you a Catholic, Protestant? What is your religion? Uh, Baptist. You're a Baptist. Okay. Well, the Baptists are very strong in the South. Okay. And they came from lower class uh, citizens, okay? Mm. If you want to hear a joke about that, I heard this joke from a Presbyterian minister. And it goes like this. A Baptist would like to be a Methodist, but he doesn't have any shoes. And a Methodist would really like to be a Presbyterian, but he doesn't have the education. And a Presbyterian would really like to be an Episcopalian, but he doesn't have the money. So what is <laughs> <laughs> Now, let's see, let's see if you understand that joke. No, I didn't. You didn't understand the joke. But I mean, in that. Well, we'll talk about that after class. Uh, we'll tell, to, talk about that after class. Compared to religion, I'm more of a science based understanding. So okay. That joke would probably go over my head because I don't really believe in a, a defined science. Well, but let's religion. talk about that after class. I think, I mean, after this show. Oh, okay. We've given you enough time, I think. But thank you for the interruption about education and the importance of education for history. So oh, to get back you. to our main theme, we. I accidentally knew the Dukakis family, so I was interested in politics, and I helped teach the Dukakis boys, both of them, Stelian and Michael. At what age? Were they? It was in college. In 1949, I was 19. Write that down on a piece of paper and ask me after class. Okay? Sorry. Because you've asked the six questions. You've asked that question three times, okay? We will discuss that after, after this TV show. I've given you sufficient time. All right, so I'd like to get back to our main theme here, how uh, editors and publishers are a special group who will endorse either the Democratic or presidential uh, candidates from either of the two major parties. And the New York Times in, uh, is a Jewish paper, in case you didn't know, and it was founded in 1896 by Adolf Oakes and his relatives, the Oakes Sulzberger family, were the three editors of that paper, the son in 1935, and the great-grandson, is still the Salzburger family newspaper. So if you have a family newspaper, you can determine the editorial policy. And the New York Times can hire the best journalists. And they had David Halberstam, 
and James Reston. And James Reston. Yeah, you've heard it, of James Reston. Oh, I read his book, Deadline. Um, yeah. Tell us about this James is Reston. By, well, uh, what I just find found interesting about him is that he started his career in Springfield, Ohio. That's right. At uh, the Springfield, was it the Daily right. Sun or something right. like that? Right. Um, which was interesting only to me personally because my family is from, my Spring. parents both grew up in Springfield, Ohio. Yeah. So uh, I read his book, Deadline, and he was, after the Springfield, uh, he was, uh, he went to cover news in England at the beginning of World War II, actually, right. where he met uh, Joe Kennedy, who we discussed last episode. Right. And, uh, and from there, he moved on to the New York Times, and he right. became a famous, uh, well-respected yeah. writer for the now, New York Times. Now, I heard James Reston give a, an address when I was a graduate student at the University of Michigan. And he was like the Kennedy lecturer on this campus. They had it in the graduate school at Michigan. And he was really impressive on the stage. And he made a statement that stuck in my mind in 19, let's see, it was 1957, I guess. I was 27 years old. And he, and he, was, he was not a, a knee-jerk anti-communist. No, he said, I, didn't, I never he, got that he, impression. You have to look at all sides of the issue. And his famous slogan was, Russians aren't 10 feet tall. You don't have to pretend that they're going to win the Cold War. Right. So he was a critic of the military-industrial complex back in 1957. and was a critic of investing in nuclear bombs. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he was a liberal correspondent who wrote editorials during that period. That's when I forgot. Yeah. So then when I became a, a working historian, and I look at the New York Times, I go right away to the rest in column and ignore the others. Oh, yeah, yeah. In other words, who yeah. you hear impresses people <laughs> on what you see. Well, these days I and pretty much only see, read Krugman out yeah, of any of them. It, yeah. it, 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 uh, it goes both ways. Some people learn orally, some people learn by reading. And, but the ideal education is to both. Oh, the yeah. dialogue going and reading, and they reinforce one another. Okay, so we're still talking about R Ronald Reagan, and Ronald Reagan uh, got some endorsements from provincial press, but not sufficient to really be important for Ronald Reagan's election. There was no paper that was able to tilt the election. The Times, the Post, opposed to uh, Reagan, the nation was opposed to Reagan, but they didn't have the mass readership that the provincial press from Pennsylvania to California had. Mm -hmm. The Oakland paper, the Oakland Tribune was run by Nolan, who was the senator from California. Mm -hmm. So the Oakland Tribune was a pro-Nixon paper from the word go. So you didn't have to you could look that up, though, and that right. was one of the papers recorded. But you could do that for all of the papers if but you would have to go. Yeah, if you, you had, had the time, you'd research. go through all of them. Yeah, you could, you could find the career of James Reston. So anyway, we spoke about the importance of newspapers for any presidential candidate. I guess we've covered enough of that. But I want to say something more about David Halberstam. Mm -hmm. David Halberstam was the New York Times reporter who went to Vietnam in 1962 and exposed the war as a war that couldn't be won. And he wrote a great book composing of New York Times columns called The Best and the Brightest. It was satire. He really meant this, the, the worst and the stupidest. And that was a denunciation of the Johnson administration and all of his hacks and the Nixon administration and all of their hacks. Because yeah. they were able to fool the voters with the anti-communist crusade. We're gonna, mm. there's light at they the end of the tunnel. They had been doing that yeah, since there's Truman. there's light at the end of the tunnel. There's light at the end <laughs> of the tunnel. And it was continued with we Eisenhower. Have to, we have to intervene in order to stop blood blast, see? Yeah. It was David Halstein who said that's all hot air. 
Yeah. And well, so I'm surprised the French experiment didn't Yeah, well, more the French, they couldn't learn from the French. But anyway, after, after uh, David Halstone became a, a bestseller, he quit the New York Times as a working reporter and became a, a, an author. And he wrote a book on the powers that be. And he had five chapters. The five powers were the media. New York Times was one chapter, CBS, one television channel, and then two other newspapers, the, Lo the Los Angeles Times and the Washington Post, three newspapers, and Time Magazine. And he has a chapter on each of those the importance of the mass media and politics. So he, he left the Times and he's also enough of, a, of an author to become a critic of the Times. Mm -hmm. So if we want to know more about the press, we can learn from David Halberstam and the powers that be. I have not read his book, but I've glanced at it. Mm -hmm. We could look at that and s see if he has some footnotes on the Reagan. Oh, it would be interesting. Yeah. yeah, that's that's further research. We could learn more if we wanted to do the research. That's all I'm saying. Well, anyway, let's talk a little bit more about the Washington Post. It had to compete with the Washington Star in 1981. That folded, and it became the only newspaper in Washington D.C. for a while. And from 1933 to 46, it was published by Eugene Meyer. And then in 1946, Eugene Meyer gave it up to Philip Graham, and he became the owner and publisher of that. And then when he died, it went to his widow, and she uh, was the last post publisher. And she hired Ben Bradley as the executive editor, and it was the Washington Post that exposed the Watergate crimes of Richard Nixon. Now, they had to sell the paper in 2013, and they've sold it to a character by the name of Jeff Bezos, who's yeah, the guy who runs Bezos, yeah. email, uh, uh, the book, Amazon Books. Amazon, yeah. The question now is, is the Washington Post going to become centrist and lose its democratic edge. It's That's the thing to be seen. It's a good question. I guess we'll find out. Well, anyway, I have a little joke about J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover said he never reads the Washington Post. He said that is the same as the daily work <laughs> the communist newspaper. And he well, said <laughs> he called the Washington Post the proud uh, of the People's Republic of the Potomac. <laughs> That's a Hoover joke. Yeah, I didn't Republican. realize he had a sense of humor. Well, you That's... have to be a Republican to understand that. Yeah. It's a joke to me. Yeah. But he took it seriously. Yeah. A lot of Republicans, what does J. Edgar Hoover think? <laughs> but he never reads the Washington Post. Well, Reagan didn't care about that. <laughs> no. Reagan didn't think it was funny. He just thought it was probably true. <laughs> I don't read the Washington Post either. <laughs> Reagan? <laughs> oh, yeah, probably. He read a special newspaper. I he don't know a, what he read. He read a newspaper called Human Events. Oh, okay. Have you ever heard I've of heard, I have heard of it. I don't know much about it. Well, it was founded in, uh, probably in the 1970s. It's a strictly, strictly anti communist first, forward, and always. Oh. It's okay. a one party line. Yeah. Communism is the enemy. So it's just a trumpet for <laughs> anti-communist sentiment. Anti -communist. For, yeah. Well, anyway, Hoover died in 1972. And Hoover's last year, uh, he got into trouble with the Nixon campaign and the final collapse of Nixon, you know. Yeah. That's another story. But it tells you the importance of the Post. And as long as we're talking about the Daily Worker, the New York Daily Worker was founded in 1924 subsidized by the common turn. It never had a big circulation. It was a myth. I think they had 10,000 readers. <laughs> and they were all investigated by the FBI. So the Daily Worker was largely 
a ghost in reality. Yeah, I think the, the New York Daily Worker peaked at 34,000 circulation, and then it collapsed in the 50s. And the one communist paper was called the Daily Worker. Mm -hmm. And they too eventually collapsed. In 1966, they changed the name to the Morning Star. It's still published as a Marxist paper with 10,000 uh, circulation, even in more liberal socialistic London. Okay, that's enough on that. Let's go to another question. Describe the character of Ronald Reagan's car uh, cabinet. His cabinet, okay. Yeah. Um, well, at the beginning, you had Alexander Haig, who was the, uh, the brash Secretary of State. He was, uh, he was fairly zealous in his opinions. Um, a uh, hardliner, I guess, is how I would describe him. You had Donald Reagan, who supported Reagan's economic agenda, which was basically, it's very similar to the economic agenda today from Republicans, lowering income taxes as much as possible and decreasing taxes for corporations. That All seems right. to be their main objectives. Um, you had Chief of Staff. Well, this is interesting. You had... His vice president was George H.W. Bush, his moderate opponent in the primary. That's right. For the Republican nomination. And as chief that was of staff. appointment. Oh, yeah. And as chief of staff, though, he took. the Republican Party. Right. And to, I guess, further do that, maybe? I'm not sure. Maybe you can shed some light That's on this. Question? James Baker. Oh, James Baker. Worked Hager. for George H.W. Bush. That's right. And. I, someone else too. I think he worked well, for. Now, what's the importance of Jake? Let's just. Well, he was. Baker. He was Reagan's chief of staff. Right. And for, what's the importance of the chief of staff? Well, that's he's the gatekeeper right. to the president. Right. The chief of staff is the one who controls yeah. access. Right. Okay. So why James Baker? Why this moderate ex George H W Bush employee? Well, oh, uh, James Baker is a Houston lawyer who knows the oil business. The in oil Texas. business in Texas. And he was originally a Democrat. Uh-huh. Now, when Johnson fades from the Democratic Party and Conley fades from the Democratic Party and the Republicans take over the Republican machine, James Pickett is part of that process. Mm-hmm. I see. So it's... Uh, Part of what, taking what the really old staff. The chief yeah. of staff is the representative of the oil business. Yeah. Okay. In other words, the oil business is right in the White House. Yeah. <laughs> Ronald if you want access, no you've just about gotten oil. all the access. <laughs> That's the importance of James Baker. Uh -huh. Anything else you want to say about that? About the whole cabinet? Um, oh, James Baker? Or, uh, I thought it was interesting how much. Um, you mentioned the Secretary of State. And, uh, Alexander Haig, yeah. Alexander Haig, and you mentioned uh, James Baker. And Donald Reagan, the what Treasury about this, what Secretary. About the CIA. The C well, he exp he got rid of uh, he expanded he recharged the CIA because under Carter, as we discussed, it was moving away from the espionage right. that it was doing, and right. and Carter was cutting back on it. Right. And with Reagan came a full resurgence. Yeah, but who was the head of the CIA? Who was the director of the CIA? After... Um, we mentioned him before. Yeah, we have. Uh, it was uh, uh, William Casey. Right, Casey. That's right. And he's the inside guy on... Well, I think we're going to have to stop now. And we'll have to stop at this uh, uh, point. Would you like to summarize in the next uh, two minutes what we've learned today? Well... Uh, today we've gotten into uh, what happened, how it changed hands, the uh, the Senate, and then the Democratic majority that maintained in the in the House of Representatives, led by Tip O'Neill right. and his relationship to right. the Reagan right White House. Right. Um, we also talked about newspaper endorsements right. and their role and the difficulty in researching them. Right. Uh, throughout these various election cycles. But it and didn't make any difference to Ronald Reagan or his cabinet. Doesn't seem to have, no. no. Um, because that's what we finished up on, is how Reagan... Yeah, and we've just outlined the key figures. ...tried to bring together the and Republican Party and his cabinet. are important for the next eight years. 
Yes. Right. And we'll have to continue this discussion. And we have to keep this debate going. And this is why we call this discussion uh, a debate is the oxygen of democracy. And I do hope you can come again. Absolutely. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Good to see you.